All right, we are live. How's it going, Jan? Good, Francis. How are you? I am good too. Let's see if we do have some people waiting. We do have Tracy and Vanessa so far. So say hello to us if you can. Um, and uh, we will um, start the podcast if uh, some people join us during the podcast. That's totally fine too. You can ask a question during the podcast. So feel free to ask any question that uh, you feel uh, relevant for that topic. And uh, we will go from there right after that. So I hope you guys had a really good week, um, that it was really uh, pleasant and really with a lot of nice weather. Um, and uh, welcome to this podcast this week. So this week we will be talking about running footwear. So specifically for running, not for any kind of other sports, um, just because there is a lot of a science be behind this and a lot of technology and a lot of knowledge. Um, and we want to focus our, um, our topics today for running, which is a really good season right now. Everybody starts running. So um, if you want to evaluate the way you run, um, and see how it goes. Um, it will uh, it will be a good podcast for you. So even after, even if you're not live, by the way, and you want to um, uh, ask any questions, um, you can like send it by email, and we will um, we will answer it um, gladly. So uh, let's uh, start this. So let's start by talking about running. So running is really complicated. We need to know that running is a sport. It's an Olympic sport. They have like different distances, um, 100 meters to 40K to even an ultra marathon, which is 100K. There's some even further than this, 200 miles. Um, so there is a lot of discipline that do provide, like do have the running as a skill. And it, it is really, really complicated. Even if we, it is the first thing that we do in our life, right after walking we will be running it doesn't mean that we know how to run um, may, many people don't know how to run properly or how to prevent unnecessary unnecessary stress to their bodies while uh, they are getting in shape or while they're training for specific sports so we need to, to also keep in mind that even if you're not running as a sport uh, you will have to know how to run for your discipline like if you play hockey hockey players they do run in their practice and their training uh, military they do run um even like well for them it's basically a basic thing that they need to know how to do but um for any other sports you will have to run uh, to get in shape so it's a good thing to know how to run even if we all think that we know how to run but it all starts also with um the proper equipment, the proper gear. So people uh, think that the cheapest shoe that you can buy at the store, uh, it will help you to uh, to run because the only thing you need is a, a surface of rubber behind, like below you. Um, I would not really agree on that. And probably Gian is also with me. Um, you need a little bit more specific shoe to, to your pattern, to your gait pattern, or even to your type of running and you'll see what type of running shooter we will talk about. Um, now, <clears throat> the first question that comes actually uh, to my mind is, should we be running barefoot or with maximal cushioning or with minimalist shoe? So let's start with that question. And I did, um, did put a question here. Let me, where is it? I thought I put it there. Just a second. No, no, no. There you go. So I think you guys see a question now. Yeah. So according to the person who is um, listening live right now, uh, when you run, what kind of running shoe do you use? Are you are you running barefoot? Minimalist shoe? Maximalist shoe? Or you don't even know what is a maximalist shoe or a minimalist shoe. <laughs> so if you can't answer that question, go ahead. Um, and I think it shows the results. Let me know if it doesn't. But uh, yeah, kind of fix it. Uh, thanks to uh, Tracy, who mentioned me the other podcast that uh, 
we couldn't see the results. So right now, um, the maximum, like uh, out of three answers, we have 67% that are using maximalis shoe. Is it good? Is it bad? That's what we're going to try to find out um, today. So let's start by knowing the purpose of a shoe. We all know that a shoe, uh, that shoes are giving comfort and protection, but they also can help us uh, with stability. Um, a good example for that is basketball shoes. If you see them, they will have support on their ankles, like it's higher. Uh, actually, uh, like the new shoes right now, you don't really see that, but the, the old shoes of basketball player, you could see like a higher support. Um, and uh, they will also, uh, help you fixing foot issues that you have, such as a flat foot. If you uh, have a flat foot, you already know what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> actually, shoe technology is so advanced these days that our feet are becoming so lazy uh, by uh, wearing shoes all the time because we lost all the properties of a shoe. And it always comes with a price running or using shoes when we play sports first of all it costs money but the second it's also heavier than not wearing shoes at all and it also changed our gait pattern and gn will demonstrate that to you guys uh, later on we need to keep in mind that your feet are and should always be your focus and also your first tool um, if you stop training your feet and buy shoes that do all the work for you, um, you may be more susceptible for injuries or lack of performance. And uh, for example, a good example that I like to use is if you uh, are in school and you're learning mathematics and you know how to calculate, do multiplication, add, uh, addition, subtractions, your head, your mind will be, will get really skilled and you will uh, answer questions really quick you will resolve problems really quick but the second that you start using calculators your brain is not really working anymore it's not really doing the math for you anymore and if you always use a calculator after a while you will lose this skill and when your calculator calculator dies you will probably like it will take you a lot of more time than usual to just do the simple math skills or math problem that you're used to do and uh, you will also probably even lose it it depends on how long you uh, you were doing using the calculator so it always it's always good to train uh, your feet with exercise and drills uh, and walking and running barefoot and training on different type of surface like a treadmill a grass sand a track um, even different type of surface of track and also cross country, etc. Use different type of surface that will help you to um, use different type of muscles. Also, your feet will become well trained and will help you to maximize your performance and also prevent any type of injuries. Now, before I ask a question to GN, I just want to remind everybody that we did me and GN follow a course last week um, that was um, held by uh, the running clinic and our uh, PhD, uh, Jean-Francois Esculier, who's from Quebec, but lives in, um, lives in Vancouver. And uh, the, the training, the course itself was really amazing. I loved it. Um, I don't know for you, Jian. Mm -hmm, it yeah. was good. It was really interesting. And uh, you will see that there's a lot of uh, base evidence that, uh, evidence base, sorry, that they used. And we all are, we are also gonna use it um, for the, the presentation today. So, Gian, what are your thoughts uh, on injury reduction effectiveness of prescribing running shoes on the basis of foot arch height? Okay, so um, there was a study published in 2014 by a fellow named Joseph Knappick, and uh, the study evaluated selecting running shoes based on arch height. Um, so basically, they took individuals um, who had either excessive pronation or underpronation cavus feet, and or supination, I guess is what they might say in a running store, and um, they chose neutral, motion controlled, or stability shoes based on the type of foot that each individual presented with. So uh, this individual. Was, or this uh, training was done with uh, military recruits and unfortunately it demonstrated that selecting shoes on the basis of arch, site, arch height had little influence on the injury risk during military training. 
So uh, they did a meta-analysis that pooled the results of three investigations, and all of them showed that there were li was little difference between the experimental and the control groups in the injury rate for men or women when shoes were, were selected based on their arch type. Um, so uh, when injury rates for specific types of running shoes were compared, there were no differences. Uh, this indicates that selecting shoes based on foot type does not reduce injury risk. There's also evidence um, that shows that picking shoes based on the weight of the runner is not an effective strategy, although weight can definitely affect the longevity of the shoes. So in a nutshell, picking shoes based on the type of foot you have hasn't really shown to be overly effective in terms of injury prevention. Interestingly enough, just to go through and brief some other research, beliefs such as the perception of shoe quality really influence runners. Um, they did a blinded study a few years ago where runners were told that they were either using a $50 pair of basic runners and the other group was told they were using a $150 pair that improved comfort and stability. Those who thought that they were wearing the expensive runners they know, interestingly enough, said that they noticed improved comfort and stability, just like they were told, even though the shoes that were used by both groups were identical. So I think this really indicates the power of commercial influences and marketing. Um, sometimes that can be more powerful than, than the, what the evidence says, unfortunately. So uh, Francis, can you bring up the video of an individual running? So we're gonna sh well, show you guys the, uh, the difference between running on a treadmill barefoot and with shoes. Perfect. Dungeon with go. this big interest. Here's someone barefoot. I just want you to take note of the position that their foot is in when they hit the treadmill, the angle of the foot, which part of the foot contacts first. You'll see it. Then, uh, you'll see it. He's going to go. You get to see this guy talk for a minute. Um, so basically, what we'll see when, when the individual runs with shoes is um, with shoes, people will tend to heel strike and also have a longer stride length, which means they'll take fewer steps per minute. There we go. So you can see there how he comes down a lot more on the heel and just note the angle of the foot. Yeah, there we go. That's a good comparison. Excellent. So barefoot running, um, typically individuals will have more of a mid or forefoot strike and they'll take shorter strides, which will equate to more steps per minute at the same pace. Um, so Francis, are you able to describe to us the characteristics of a minimalistic shoe? Minimalist shoe, rather? Yes, I can. If I uh, stop the video. <laughs> and I will um, actually... So to better understand the meaning of uh, a, a minimalist shoe and a maximalist shoe is to see, this, uh, to see it as a spectrum or an index. So let me show you what I mean about a spectrum or an, an index. Um, pretty sure it's this one. Nope, that's not the one. This one maybe. Wait a minute, no, it's this one, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so this is the index that we're talking about. So the more you add 0%, or closer to zero percent, the more you're at maximalish shoes. Um, the more you're at a hundred percent, the more you're going to be at minimalish shoe. So the main goal of uh, the minimalish shoe is to provide minimal interface with interface uh, interference. Sorry, with the natural movement of the foot while running. So you don't want to lose that gait pattern that you're having when you're running barefoot, or uh, the least as possible. And a minimalist shoe will have some properties that other shoe cannot give you. So, for example, uh, they will have a wider shape at the forefoot uh, to provide room for the toes to move and expand. The, the, this property may decrease the chance of developing forefoot deformities, such as a hammer uh, has hammer or claw toes. Minimalist shoe will also offer maximum flexibility to allow you uh, to allow the foot to move as it me as it meant to be um, so the shoe will have less stability less cushioning and a thinner th a sole um, the, there is evidence ba based uh, to support that the use of minimalistic shoes 
increased full foot muscle size and strength that uh, um, and that increase uh, foot strength improve running performance so uh, for a maximal shoe uh, it's quite the opposite the shoe will have maximum properties that help your feet um, to do the running um, so they have um, to do less work and the shoe assists uh, all the rest you got to see it as um, uh, this the spectrum with five characteristics so the first one they're gonna look at is the stack height the drop the flexibility the weight and the motion control technology so these five characteristics will determine if your shoe is more maximalis or minimalis the running clinic offers really good documents that give you all the information needed to understand the difference between this um, and I can show you that not opening every because we have a lot of pictures today so I just don't want to make sure I just want to make sure I'm opening the right one and this is the document that explained to you what are the properties of a minimal issue. They also, is it on that document? No, it's going to be, well, you have the properties that we are talking about here, the five characteristics uh, that they are looking for on a shoe. Um, but you will also uh, see in another document this one here that I'm going to show you. This document is kind of a, like a, a guideline. So if you, uh, it's selecting the right running shoes. So I'll send you the document right after I'm done with uh, showing you the pictures. But uh, if you are running and you want to know if you can uh, go with what kind of shoe you have to go with, you just need to uh, go and answer these questions here. So I, I usually run in a traditional shoes. If it's a yes, you go down. If it's a no, you go with a minimalist shoe. Uh, minimalist shoe, you see on the left side, it's more with something that it's above 50% on the index. And maximalist, it's something that it's below 50%. Um, so if you answer no, you go directly to the minimal minimalist. If you answer yes, you go with the second one, which I would like to prefer better, uh, perform better. Sorry, if you say yes, you want to go to minimalist if no you go below i'm currently injured if it's a yes uh you gotta go down but if you if, it, if you say no um you go with a minimalist index um below 50 percent uh, which is going to be closer to maximalist uh, since less than six weeks so if you got injured less than six weeks ago you uh, if you said no it's going to be um on the left so you just follow this Till the end and that's going to help you to uh, better know what kind of index so where on the index you're supposed to go um, and uh, how to select your shoes for the next one um, other than that there is also oh I think it's on that document um, here you, you're gonna read this it says when transitioning to a new type of shoe be gradual and allow one month for every 10 to 20 percent change of minimalist index so you could follow that um me my opinion about this is if you do have a lot of money uh, because that's going to be uh, like 12 pair of shoes per year um if you are doing this um like it says it's a lot of uh, shoes um but if you don't have a lot of money you can try other uh, type of gradual trans transitioning if you want to go to a minimal issue um, but this is a good recommendation you can try it see how it goes but um, that's it on my part so Gian do you have an example of a difference in heel strikes between a maximalist and a minimalist shoe mm -hmm. do we have a picture I think that you can bring up do we so I'm gonna get you guys who are listening there's not many of you but if you can do me a favor and I'm gonna get you to stand up and if you can just do a little bounce, and I want you to land on your heels. So just hop up and land on your heels and feel what that feels like. That's gonna hurt. Then we're going to do the same thing. I want you to do a little hop and land on your toes and feel the difference. 
So when you land on your heels, you can even feel your teeth jar together. There's a lot of impact with with a heel strike, and, and that's essentially the difference between a, a heel strike and a forefoot strike in terms of how that affects the kinetic chain of the body. So if you take a look at the picture up there, um, the shoe on the left hand side is uh, more leaning towards a maximalist or max yeah maximalist type of shoe. The one on the right hand side is more of a minimalist type style of shoe. So with that increased heel strike that, that we see on the left hand shoe, um, we can see there's a, a decrease in the foot strike angle with the more minimalist shoe. This will in turn decrease the forces at the knee, but it will increase the forces at the foot and ankle because when we have that more midfoot strike, the muscles and the um, joints of the midfoot and, and the ankle, they are what decelerate us to manage that impact. So minimalist shoes, decrease your heel strike, which helps out your knee, your hip, your lower back, but it can increase the compression, the impact forces, and the activity, muscle activity required of the foot. So that, that is important to, to remember. Um, sorry, I've got a staple in a bad place. There we go. So... Um, other studies that have uh, focused on the influence of shoe type um, on impact forces, um, we have, yeah, there we go, there's that study that's showing a few different studies there. Um, so these studies have concluded that the maximal cushioning in a, in a maximum style shoe increases the ground impact and knee joint forces, which seems kind of counterintuitive, but the extra cushioning doesn't make up for the difference in shock absorption with a heel strike versus a mid or forefoot strike. So that extra cushioning doesn't doesn't make up for the change in position that your foot contacts the ground. Um, one study showed that the forces behind the kneecap, and if any of you watched our uh, podcast about patellofemoral syndrome, this would be relevant. Um, forces behind the kneecap were 20% higher with each step in those wearing maximalist shoes compared to those in a more minimalistic style. Another study showed an increase of 33% in the vertical ground reaction forces in those wearing maximalist shoes. So then do we have a picture... Where is the load? There you go. There we go. Yeah, perfect. So we can see there, you look at the spectrum the spectrum there that Francis showed you before with the 0% or more maximalist shoe versus the 100% or more minimalist shoe. So the forces at the knee will decrease as we go into the minimalist shoe, the forces of the foot and calf will increase. So I think it's really important to know that it kind of depends on what we're trying to deal with. I, I wouldn't say that everyone should go to a minimalist shoe. It just depends on what kind of problems you have. And that's where that flow chart is really useful. So um, when transitioning to minimalist shoes, um, so as Francis had said, we want to go slowly and respect limits. So if you are new to running, we consider shoes with a minimalist index over 60. So again, a higher number is more minimalist. It's a little bit confusing. Um, if you currently have a shoe that is on the 10% index, for instance, so more maximalist, it may take you around five to nine months to make a com complete transition to a minimalist shoe toward that 100% index. So it's not something you want to go quickly with. I actually had a patient years ago um, uh, when the Vibram Five Fingers were fairly new. I'm old because I was around when those were new. Um, he was very adamant that this was the way he was going to go. And, and I remember having a conversation with him that I was a little bit concerned. He had, he had some underlying problems. I thought, I don't know about this whole thing. And um, he went kind of cold turkey into these shoes. And within two weeks, he had full-fledged stress fractures of both tibias. So it's definitely, and I didn't say I told you so, even though I was kind of tempted. But um, so it is something that you do have to have to be smart about and not not just kind of go gangbusters right off the hop or there, there will be problems. So as, as Francis shows you, um, you should follow the guidelines that the running clinic created. It's a great resource. Their website's wonderful. They have um, really good resources for athletes as well as for clinicians. Um, and this can help you with the selection of the right shoe for you. Um, you can also go onto the running clinic website and answer the questions and they can recommend shoes for you based on an algorithm. Um, so research shows that 76% of runners and 62% of healthcare professionals believe that shoes are important in the prevention of running injuries. I think it's really important to remember that injury is a result of an imbalance between load and capacity. So load 
includes things such as speed, mileage, your terrain or changing your terrain frequently, um, changing your footwear, changing mechanics. Capacity takes into account fatigue, nutrition, your tissue tolerance, your overall health, even your mental health status. Shoes are only one component of that equation when we look at load versus capacity. So other adaptations may need to occur. You may need to modify your training load, gait modifications, exercises, but shoes are not the magic ticket. That is one very, very small piece of the puzzle. But it is important also to remember that shoes do change the way people run. They can be used to shift forces to different parts of the body. Um, studies in 2015 and, and um, 17 showed that minimalist shoes have a beneficial effect on running economy and that the gait ad adaptations resulting from minimalist shoes may further increase these benefits. So just a few important things to remember. And also, um, Gian, are there any injuries for you you would specifically recommend minimalistic shoes for? For sure, yeah. Like, I think if someone has persistent knee problems, um, whether it's patellofemoral syndrome or knee osteoarthritis, even perhaps patellar tendinopathy, those folks, I would say that they should go more toward that minimalist index. I think persistent hip problems as well as low back pain, um, those are, are often things too that can benefit from that uh, absence of a heel strike during, during gait. Um, also for people who want to improve their performance, I think it's important to remember that a minimalist shoe will always be lighter than a maximalist shoe and there are, uh, that pays dividends. In terms of people that I would not recommend a minimal issue, um, people with acute foot pain, uh, I would stay away from it, as well as foot and ankle osteoarthritis. I think those folks could get in a lot of trouble because the foot, again, has to absorb those shock, that shock. And uh, if there's problems inherent to the foot, it may not have that capacity. So Francis, from your perspective, do you have any other recommendations? Oh, yes, I do. Um... There is also um, a, a factor that we need to keep in mind. It's when you buy a shoe, um, you need to change them. You don't know when, uh, you don't know, like you probably heard, uh, sorry, there's a uh, text thing coming in, but uh, you probably heard, I don't know, um, people saying like, uh, if you run 10,000 hours or if you run 10,000 or uh, 1,000 miles, you need new shoes. Um, I don't really agree with that. I more uh, will go more with the characteristic that we uh, were talking before, the five characteristic and also the purpose of the shoe. So when you buy a shoe, uh, when it's brand new, um, I'm going to show you a shoe that is close to brand new. Um, I bought these a couple years ago, but I never really use it because I don't really use it. Uh, I don't really run cross, cross country. Sorry, but uh, that shoe itself, what you want to see is his characteristics. So when you look at the sole, you look at the grip below. When you see that the grip is still intact, you still have all the grip that you were having before, that is a good sign that the shoe is still good. Also, there are some shoes that has an anti-torsion, like I'm trying to, tor to uh, create a torsion here, and it's very hard. So if you still have that, that is an also a sign that the shoe is still good for you. Also, what I like to do is I put, I take my thumb and I put it in the shoe inside, just because this is where your foot is. And if you push and you see that there's a cushion, that's also a good sign because sometimes when you run a lot with a shoe, you go, you're gonna lose that cushioning. Um, but as after that, you're gonna look at the boots of the shoe. If uh, the boots, you have any holes inside the boots, you can see that a person like sometimes for me, my shoes when they're really old and really um, not good anymore, I'll see a hole right here on this part of the shoe because my foot tends to go on the outside. If you see that hole here, the boot cannot provide you the stability that you're looking for. So it's a good sign that you probably need to change this pair of shoe and also everything else. If you cannot tie your shoe properly, and just on that, there is the, there is a document that I did, but there is different type of tying your shoe um, on a different type of foot. If you have a larger foot on the four on the forefoot and like less wide on the on the heel, you can tie your shoe differently than normally. So you can look on the, the different type of tying your shoe to have a proper tie. But with that said, if your shoe is providing all the characteristics that you need 
um, you will uh, you can keep it. It's a good sign. I got another pair of shoe here, but this one is pretty much like the other one. I, I use this one pretty often, um, but it's still good. It's used, but still have all the properties. The only last one that I can show you, this is a minimalist shoe that I bought in Hawaii. And as you can see, they try to mimic the, the foot. Um, it has the properties of a minimalist shoe, but the problem is this is the lace or the lace uh, that is supposed to be connected on this side and it broke. Um, so actually if I run with this, I'm gonna lose this property on the top. So technically it would be not recommended to run with that. And lucky me, I don't really run with this. I just go in the ocean or in the water with this shoe. So it's just uh, the purpose of uh, the shoe. This is one, uh, one of my recommendations. I would not go with the amount of hours, like who knows how many hours I wear this shoe or how many miles I run this shoe. So it's kind of like a, a subjective information. I would go more with objective follow these characteristics look at your shoe if it does provide you all the characteristic i will stick still keep it if not i will uh, buy a new pair of shoe and when you buy a new pair of shoe if you want to do the transition from a maximalist shoe to a minimalist shoe that's a good thing take the index or go on the website like gian uh, mentioned of the runningclinic.com and you can uh, select or answer all the questions and they will tell you what kind of shoe you need. Probably not the brand, but just more like what type of shoe are you looking for? Because they're not, they're kind of like neutral. They just don't want to tell you like, oh, buy a New Balance, uh, this type of shoe this year. They might just tell you like these type of shoes are good for you. So you can buy whatever uh, it's in that, that category. So you can follow uh, the transition by going on the runningclinic.com or having the documents that I didn't even send you yet but I will right now. So this is uh, my recommendation so far. Uh, Gian, do you have anything else to add? Well, I think just in conclusion, um, comfort is the most is the single most important factor when purchasing a pair of running shoes. So comfort should include the absence of pressure points that could cause deformation or irritation of the foot. So you want to consider the size, width, and shape of the foot, especially the forefoot and toes when standing still and walking or running. And uh, minimalist choices are best for children and for beginner runners. Um, sometimes we get into bad habits if we have been wearing more maximalist shoes, even if that isn't the best choice for us. As we said before, the, um, the foot muscle atrophy can occur. And sometimes we don't, again, it's not, a, not great to transition immediately. But for beginners, um, they can go directly into a minimalist shoe as well as kids. And that's, that's a good place for them to start. So yeah, I think that's all I have for my end, Francis. Awesome. So that was um, the topic of today, the, um, the running shoe based on uh, studies. So to finish, I just want to show you like um, it took me an hour to do that today. So it's kind of fun to show it. Um, just uh, the amount of studies that it's behind this. Uh, there's a lot of studies and there's also some studies that I didn't show just because um, they're not published yet. So they're in uh, some some uh, last approbation or whatever. It's going to be published this year, but you can see that there's a lot of studies behind this. So it's kind of good because um, you, like this presentation, it's a big summary of what all uh, the the scientific are doing and publishing. And uh, you can use these. Uh, you can go and read these documents. Like I would strongly recommend. Uh, to go read these documents if you're really into research. Uh, but if not, that's totally fine too. But uh, yeah, it's based on these studies. And um, it's a very interesting one. Now, it may not work uh, following the guidelines uh, for you. If that's the case, I would go with um, a professional. So uh, you can go ask a health professional for recommendation, a person who's really uh, doing this, uh, like know his stuff. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't go really into um, like, for example, I don't want to name any stores. It's not the main goal here, but if you go in a store and they know their product that's on sale and what's the special on the product, that's good, but they don't tell you what is the proper shoe for you. Um, if you go, for example, to the running clinic, or if you go talk to a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist or whatever, they can probably more give you better guidelines 
for your um, for your uh, your what you're looking for. So we're not really selling a brand; we're more selling a proper shoe for you. So that would be my recommendation um, on the future step that you want to try uh, in the future. And um, for uh, that, not, right now, a uh, good news: the gym at the base is open. <laughs> So uh, people are having access to the gym. They can go work out. Yes, it's a, a really weird way that we do it because it's not like we were doing it in the past. But uh, it takes a little bit uh, more time on both of us, on me and GN. So we will also uh, still do some podcasts, but it will not be weekly. It uh, will be less than weekly, I would say probably every two weeks. Um, just to give us more preparation because there's a lot of preparation behind this, a lot of wor- hours of work that we do um, to set up a good podcast for you guys. So you do have, uh, like we still recommend you guys that if you do have a topic that you would like to share mm-hmm. and that you would like to, us to talk about, to go and uh, ask for it, just send an email, we'll do on this. Um, also, if you are a health professional that um, would like to be a special guest on that podcast, uh, just get in touch with us. That's also an, another thing that we are uh, going to uh, be gladly accepting. Um, but other than that, yeah, um, so the next podcast will be in two weeks and uh, you will know the topics uh, uh, then. <laughs> um, and we uh, will uh, come up with something really interesting. So till then, uh, if you guys don't have any questions and uh, if uh, that's all for today, we're going to end up that podcast right now. Um, awesome. Anything to add, Gian? No, I think that's it for me. No. Nope. Perfect. So have a nice week. See yeah, you, you next time on the podcast. Okay. And uh, okay. same thing for all of you guys. All right. Yeah, thanks. See you guys Take then. care. Bye.